going local has always been one of the catch cries of the sustainability movement in our everyday lives. But the modern solar industry has been built on a globalized supply chain, which has brought down the cost of solar and made PV the powerhouse it is today. But can we go local with solar cell and module production? And if so, how can it be made to happen? My name is Jonathan Gifford. I'm the editor-in-chief of PV Magazine Global, and welcome to this Roundtables Europe event. And I'm Friederike Egerer, head of events at PV Magazine. This is our third cornerstone session focused on sustainability and made in Europe PV. Pros, cons and opportunities. This afternoon, we will round off this event with our Innovation Hub session, putting hydrogen and battery storage in focus. We will discuss the opportunities for the solar industry. Yesterday, we started today with our renowned quality session. We looked at his holistic approaches to quality, but also focused on the details by looking inside large format modules to get a better understanding and handling of the technology risks and challenges. In the afternoon, we had a look at how to prepare for new sustainability rules, rules also known as ESG, and how to handle old assets and de-risk new ones. The asset management cornerstone took due diligence into focus. In case you couldn't join yesterday, don't worry. We will update you via email as soon as the recordings are available. We will also upload all release slide decks into each respective speaking slot at the, on the event platform as soon as the session is finished. Also, you can check out the reporting of our colleagues on our French, German, Spanish and global platform. They covered yesterday's sessions and will continue to do the same today. Over 1,000 of you already participated yesterday and joined in various networking opportunities. You can look forward to even more networking today, from speed networking to engaging discussions in French, German, English and Spanish in our big ne bigger networking rooms. Get involved and meet your peers. You can also join the discussion on social media and share your experiences by using the dedicated hashtag RTEU21. And thanks to our networking partner, FEMA, and our platinum partners, DuPont, Goodwe, GrowWatt, Jinko Solar, and Smart Energy. And our gold and silver partners for getting involved in our Roundtables program and partnering with PV Magazine on the event. We've had an overarching theme throughout our Roundtables Europe program, and that's that this decade will really see solar change Europe's energy system and grow from being a bit player to the main event. But with any disruptive change, there are winners and losers. And at the moment, the fossil fuel industry here in Europe employs thousands of people right across the continent. Can the same be said of solar if we import the primary components from overseas? It is a big picture question. Economics, national and regional politics and international efforts to tackle climate change. All of these and more impact the solar industry and are the basis for a just energy transition. Conscious thinking and sustainability is also becoming ever-present, moving from small personal decisions to holistic approaches on an overarching level. It's becoming part of everything we do. As you will see, our program this morning reflects exactly this. We will discuss the granular details of Made in Europe PV, but also focus on the broader sustainability aspects. On the technology front, we're going to hear from some solar companies that have very much been at the forefront of development for many years to look at the solar cell and module architectures that could make PV manufacturing right here in Europe a reality. But as Frederica mentioned, this is still very much a political discussion. And we have a leading European politician kicking off our event today. As a reminder, get involved in the discussion really at any point by submitting a question on the event app just to the right hand side of the stream. Our first speaker of the day is the spokesperson for the German Greens in the European Parliament and a coordinator of the Greens European Free Alliance Group in the Economy and Monetary Affairs Committee. As a studied political economist, he has been active in the environmental movement for more than 20 years. Welcome, Sven Giegold. Welcome as well. Thank you for your invitation. Good to see you. <laughs> Good morning. Um, well, well, Sven, uh, take us inside the European Green Deal. Look, uh, the picture is horrible, which I'm seeing. I hope uh, that is a very small, yes, uh, but I will do that. And uh, I would like to, to first, uh, first congratulate you to this event. Uh, I think it is of crucial importance uh, that we build and strengthen industrial policy for European uh, PV 
and for the European uh, solar industry. Uh, look, um, as you perhaps know, we are ch uh, challenging for chancellery in Germany, and our lead candidate for chancellery is leading the polls. Uh, and uh, we are running on a program which will be decided just on Saturday and uh, with the final vote uh, on Sunday with a new trajectory for German PV installations of uh, 18 um, gigawatt uh, per year, which means a stark increase. And we are also ready to open uh, free space areas in order uh, to increase uh, the, the solar energy production which we need. We are fully conscious that uh, such a trajectory for Germany as well as for the EU as a whole can only function if the state gets active. I think we have seen during the corona crisis uh, the negative side effects. If you want to turn around uh, key areas of industry and the state remains too passive. And uh, we have seen the problems in production of vaccines. In PV, it's of course different. Uh, we have a functioning solar industry. However, uh, production is uh, happening mainly in China. We have very little uh, own European production capacity. Uh, China has announced uh, to increase the production uh, radically, which is good news for the world. On the other hand, Europe cannot uh, stand aside and being only dependent on foreign input. Uh, therefore, uh, we, I believe we need first for the production capacity, but also for the installation, a full set of industrial policy tools in order to make that happen. So this starts with shortages in staff, but also the danger of um, limits in the whole supply chain. And this is something where the state can help. We should not uh, do the job of the industry, but we should use public policy in order to help shortages to be overcome. Another uh, key issue is, of course, the limits to resource availability and the environmental and social quality of the resources. When we built uh, the PV industry uh, even stronger than today, as one of the two backbones of our future energy system, we need uh, at the same time to be very clear on the um, on the sourcing of the resources and their social and environmental quality. It is not acceptable for Europe that in the supply chain, you have human rights violations, few, um, um, forced labor or environmental destruction. And this is why we are strongly in favor of a binding due diligence regime for Europe, which makes sure that the sourcing is clean. And this will also uh, limit some info, um, unjust uh, pricing advantages of uh, the sourcing, uh, for instance, from China, which is important. So we should say European values have to be in the products which are used in Europe. Uh, and uh, of course, this can be done also in third countries. So this is not a protect protectionist measure. It is a measure in order to defend our own value system. Uh, this also uh, should open the possibility uh, for respective um, changes in the framework of um, EU state aid rules. Uh, state aid rules should support the green transformation. Of course, they should not open the box to unfounded uh, state subsidies. But on the other hand, they should not be naive and they have to be uh, at the same time in a logical coherence with what we do uh, for the Green Deal. So we in the German Greens, we will fight uh, for the green transformation at the heart of the next German government, which would then finally mean finally also a government which fully supports all aspects of the energy transformation and the Green Deal in Europe, expect another German voice in this regard in the future. 
Thank you very much for that, Sven. Now, you mentioned, um, <coughs> my, excuse me, targets for installations in Germany. Um, it, uh, you also mentioned an industrial policy. What, what progress is being made in terms of an industrial policy for renewable energy um, products, including solar? Uh, do you mean on the European level or on the German level? Well, the, so the when target it comes you to would... Germany, when it comes Indeed. to Germany, I would say uh, the because of uh, some um, ideological limits, uh, there has been a totally naive approach to this. So uh, first, there was a phase of uh, very helpful um, uh, feed-in tariffs. This led to the build-up of a German uh, and also supported a European um, production capacity in PV. And then uh, there was a far, there was an over subsidization for some period of time. This was a strategic mistake. Uh, but then the reaction to this oversubsidization was an abrupt reduction of the price, which destroyed basically uh, the PV industry in Germany, at least a lot of it. And this is quite the opposite of industrial policy. It was uh, industrial uh, uh, destruction. And uh, this has not fundamentally changed. And, uh, and what you can expect is uh, that uh, we have a clear policy preference to rebuild a more independent um, sourcing uh, in Europe. And we can see at the moment in many industries the consequences uh, of a lack of reliance and res um, resilience in industrial sourcing. So we are seeing shortages in a whole number of global supply chains. And we cannot afford that such shortages destroy our critical life-saving objectives uh, in, um, in the energy transformation. And you can expect that we will be a much more proactive player in this than we were in the past. Well, can, <clears throat> can we then expect to see a change to kind of state aid rules um, that may facilitate um, more funding of solar manufacturing? We're seeing that battery manufacturing is really being assisted um, very much on a European level, but could it be changed uh, to assist solar? Well, I have to say that, uh, of course, this should not be unfounded. We have already, of course, in the framework of the uh, recovery and resilience facilities, the possibility to use this money in this uh, direction. Member states are very much invited to do so. And we won in the European Parliament, as you know, the, co the binding obligation to use 37% of the funding uh, for the Recovery and Resilience Fund, for the Green Deal. Of course, it's open for the member states how much they go into the energy sector, but they are free to do this. And uh, we see a lot of greenwashing in these programs, which is very unfortunate because we will would need this money uh, also for an economic uh, turnaround uh, in the energy sector. Uh, however, uh, when it comes to the state aid rules, as you know, uh, Vestaya is on the way of, uh, of reworking the rules. And uh, we believe not only for solar, but in general, that there should be a possibility of a logic what we call contracts for difference. So this means uh, if there is a pricing difference between a sustainable product and a non-sustainable one on the global market, then there should be a possibility to help industry uh, to bridge the gap. And this logic of contract for difference is very important to us. And we expect the commission uh, to take this logic into account so that the green transformation can actually also happen based on European production. And is there any pushback from other uh, political parties in Germany in, in terms of this position that you're, you're setting out? Well, my impression is actually that between the pro-European parties, uh, there is, is a lot of openness for the basic logic. We have also here common uh, views with the mainstream industrial um, associations. So this is not... Uh, uh, that is not so much the problem. Where we have, of course, tension is, I say that very openly, uh, the German economist uh, associations. So the, 
was very much based on the on an ideology i would even say generally against uh, public subsidies and um, and of course sub uh, there has been a lot of damage done with uh, subsidies on the other hand we may not be totally naive we see on a global level the changes and the strategy in particular of china uh, to use uh, direct or indirect subsidies in order to regain control of all of the key future industries. And therefore, there has to be a reaction to it. Logically, you can do two things. Either you close the borders or you balance the subsidies. And if we don't want to close the borders, because this is would lead into protectionist uh, races, we have to have a rational basis uh, for matching this level of subsidies. We should not over-subsidize, we should be careful what we do, but we should not be naive anymore. I don't want to return uh, too much or laboriously to, to this point, but we are seeing that, that battery storage uh, projects, manufacturing projects, are receiving more, more support by way of subsidies, and you have made a very coherent case for subsidies for manufacturing. Why is it that you think solar modules, solar cell manufacturing may be considered differently by policymakers? Well, I, my impression is that this has uh, a reason uh, and that is that Europe had a successful PV industry and lost it because of co um, competitive pro uh, pressures. With batteries, there is a lot more um, research and innovation. So new battery types are coming in. I recently held a, a big uh, webinar on this with uh, several thousand participants uh, being excited about batteries. So there's future development. Europe is putting research money into it. And there's a new chance that a, a new type and class of products can have their home in Europe. Of course, also there, China has an advantage, but we have much more um, innovation going in the system. Uh, and this means uh, that therefore, perhaps public policymakers have more interest here. But let us not discuss batteries against PV. Let us rather discuss storage and production together. This is one, in the end, this is one industrial system and not two separate ones which should compete with each other. Indeed. Now, we have some questions um, from our attendees. Um, one is, what is the chances for international investors for implementation? How will policies help and how resource subsidies uh, are providing for the establishment of this international uh, investment in production? Well, uh, look, uh, at least we are doing one thing. Uh, we, are, we are setting very clear signals for the financial institutions uh, internationally, and this will be rolled out also to insurances and investment funds, uh, that uh, the customers and markets can see how green their respective investment portfolios is. And uh, this will put push more funds uh, into all the green industries. Uh, ideally, it will reduce also funding costs uh, for um, the renewable sector in comparison to other sectors. And beyond that, of course, uh, international investors are, uh, are welcome in Europe. Uh, there is no, um, no difference between uh, foreign and local investors, at least uh, uh, with the exception of some strategic uh, areas. But generally, there is a welcoming uh, open uh, market. Huh? So, uh, and of course, uh, increasing uh, the installation capacity so rad radically means uh, that this is an, a privately based investment program uh, triggered by public policy. This is what we want. So we want public policy, uh, but we don't want the state to do these investments. We want private investors uh, to do the job. We don't think that uh, the state is better in building the, the capacity, but the state has to help the private investors uh, to solve problems which may arise on the way. And another question from our attendees. Do you expect that the future carbon border adjustment mechanism can apply to non-sustainable or less sustainable PV imports? Hmm. Uh, this is really a, a, a very uh, pertinent question. I, I will try to answer as honestly as possible. The carbon, uh, the, the border adjustment mechanism uh, is of course built on an assumption that you um, 
do have uh, you fail to build a global uh, a global level playing field if we fail to build a global level playing field that would be very bad news for the paris agreement so this means uh, ideally we achieve a level more, much more level playing field uh, with uh, other actors in the world because um, if we have a trade war with China and the US, and both have made very much clear that they do not like a European carbon border adjustment mechanism, then we would be really in a bad situation. So this tool has to be developed, uh, but of course with the objective that it must never be used. However, a, a totally different question is, if we import uh, certain goods and services and use them in Europe, they should correspond to European values. So this is uh, the, the issue of the due diligence uh, in the supply chain. This we should make obligatory. Uh, and by that way, we also have a positive effect for, for a more level playing field. But the, the, the border mechanism is mainly a threat uh, if we achieve a global alliance to revive Paris, probably uh, this will be uh, never applied. But um, I may be wrong. Uh, we will work on the legislative basis for it. But whether it will really be applied depends on the willingness of other partners to work towards a level playing field. Well, Sven Giegold, thank you very much for kicking off our first session today as a part of Roundtables Europe. We had more questions than we could get to, but thank you very much for your time. Thank you and all the best. So, what is the rationale for Made in Europe PV? We welcome these four panelists to share their expertise. Johan Lindahl, Secretary General of ESMC the European Solar Manufacturing Council. He has extensive experience of market and regulatory topics concerning the PV industry. We also welcome Senior Policy Advisor of Solar Power Europe, Naomi Chevilla. She follows the main European legislation related to renewable policy, engaged energy taxation and grid integration of solar. Jenny Chase. Jenny has been with Bloomberg NEF since 2005 and is joining us today in her role as Head of Solar Analysis. And as a fourth panelist, we welcome Matthew King, Manager of Global Commercial Operations and International Owned M Provider, Belectric. Hello, everyone. Hello. 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 Hi. Um, Johan, let's start the discussion with you. We just heard from Sven Giegold that supply chains have been impacted by COVID um, over the last 12 to 18 months. Um, how do you at the ESMC um, see this in terms of the PV industry? Um, what effects have been felt? Well, well, it's the general uh, sort of conclusion that when uh, when everything works as, as uh, we believe it should, and when it comes to trade, it's no problems. But uh, as the pandemic has shown, uh, being reliant on import uh, uh, can put Europe in a sensitive place. I'm not talking only about PV, but other other parts uh, and other in the industry in Europe as a whole. We see the microelectronics, we see medical medical equipments. Uh, so yeah, it's it's the same case for PV uh, that uh, if if the trade are, are disrupted to, due to something, it of course can slow down our uh, green transition. Okay. Thank you, Johan. Matthew, I'll bring you into the conversation here. You know, project developers, you guys are probably at the pointy end of supply chain disruption. Um, how's it been impacting your uh, your business? Can you can you describe that for us? Yeah, well, it, it's had a detrimental effect. Um, availability of, of raw materials, uh, for starters, uh, with a knock-on effect of, of parts availability, uh, and then logistical costs um, have increased significantly, we've, we've found, um, over the last few months. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's been a hard, hard old trail over the, over the last uh, few months while things have been ramping back up again after, after COVID, while whilst we are still... Um, building sites, um, we, we have found that there, there is uh, a detrimental effect on, on, on cost and availability to, to our business. And in terms of costs then, uh, are you actually seeing any European projects not going ahead because of um, increased kind of costs? 
there there is potential of that yes um you know module costs increasing uh, certainly the logistical costs have have taken us uh, to a point with some of our clients where they have been deemed um to be non economical um so so yes we we have had uh, some projects we are still in discussions with having to change bill of materials um, to, to, to suit um, because it, at the end of the day, it is a, a cost-driven process um, and and it's it's detrimental effect, detrimentally affected um, the, the, uh, the models. Okay, thank you for that insight. So you can kind of see where this argument is going. Now, Ami, I'll bring you into the conversation here. We are seeing supply chains uh, being, being stretched, um, costs going up because of um, uh, COVID disruption and other factors as well. Um, do you see this kind of informing a, a, an increased level of discussion about um, increased PV module manufacturing, maybe even cell manufacturing within Europe? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I mean, about about the COVID disruptions, I think uh, still we have also to acknowledge that um, the situation hasn't that been that terrible. Uh, we we still managed to maintain uh, imports of products to Europe. We still had a market that was uh, quite resilient uh, despite the COVID. I think it was not the case in in all value chains. Now it's it's absolutely true that what we see the increase of module cost, the increase of shipping cost also uh, make the case for, uh, indeed, a more local development of, uh, of manufacturing. I don't think this is the only, uh, the only driver. I think uh, uh, it is also driven by opportunities uh, and challenges. We also have uh, um, uh, technological, uh, technological assets to, uh, to, to, to value in Europe, uh, for example, on... on heterojunction technology, um, we clearly have a leadership. And I think what Maya Berger, for example, is doing is, uh, is very interesting uh, in Germany at the moment. Of Maya Berger CEO, Gunther Erfurt, joining our event uh, very shortly. Jenny Chase, a number of factors disrupted supply chains, um, a number of factors that Naomi has pointed to, um, building momentum potentially for made in Europe production, um, from Bloomberg NEF, who tracks these global supply chains and these pretty remarkable price declines we've seen over the last decade. How convinced are you that the case is building for European production? I'm, I'm not convinced. I mean, I'm not sure that if we had manufacturing in Europe, we would not have seen the same price increases in the last three months. I mean, we saw almost no disruption due to the pandemic that actually seem to affect installation in 2020. So and so when you when you're talking about prices then you're saying that just some primary you know aluminium some kind of primary materials those prices would have flown through to european manufacturers just the same. I think probably yes. I mean there seems to be basically there's a global economic upswing right now that is driving the commodity prices up. And there is some weird stuff going on in polysilicon, which I don't think is related to all the polysilicon capacity being in China. It's, it's due to a fundamental perception of a supply-demand imbalance in 2021, which we don't really think is necessarily true. Um, I'm quite relieved to say that this week the polysilicon price did, actually, did not go up. And I think... I mean, it's important, to, there's context in this. I think it's great to have the option of buying European uh, panels. It's probably worthwhile maintaining some kind of industry here. But if we were entirely dependent on European manufacturing, then this would still be a cottage industry. And do you see a risk that um, if some protectionist measures could be brought in, that this will impact deployment? Definitely, yes. I mean, that's kind of the idea, isn't it? So how, what's the total capacity to make cells and modules in Europe? Maybe maybe a gigawatt? Now Maya Burger's online and um, including everyone. And most of those companies will get their ingots and wafers from China. So let's not pretend there's a sort of China-free value chain or that that's even particularly desirable. Um, China's really good at making ingots and wafers. That's why they do it. Um, and I, so I do think it would significantly slow down deployment if we put the brakes on imports. 
Okay. Well, we have some questions from our attendees, Federica. Yes, indeed. Um, one of the obstacles, um, in the opinion of one of our attendees, was that European product uh, to European production was that companies did not want to invest so much. Did this, in your opinion, change? And uh, will mainly non-European companies, in your opinion, invest? Um, Naomi, I see you nodding. How about you <laughs> start us off? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, I think this has indeed ch changed. We can, of course, accelerate. But if you look at just industrial investment, you, you see uh, Maya Berger investing into uh, into their own factory, into uh, Oxford PV factory. Um, but even if you look at uh, at investment banks, I mean, we have more and more discussions with uh, with private banks uh, as part of the of the European Solar Initiative, this initiative that we launched uh, to promote solar PV manufacturing. We, with this initiative, we really had discussions with the European Investment Bank, uh, with private banks. We also launched uh, a new investment platform with uh, EIT New Energy, which is uh, an investment fund that's investing into, into battery uh, projects. So I think this, is, this, is, this shows really how and the, the, the fact that things are, are really changing on the investment side of things. Great, thank you, Naomi. And another question from our attendees, and I think this pertains to cost. What is the percentage differences observed after and before COVID in the supply chain? Uh, Jenny, I think that's cost. What is the percentage difference in terms of overall costs? And Matt, I'll, let, I'll, I'll send that over to you afterwards as well. So I don't have the percentage off the top of my head. The module price hit $19 uh, cents per watt in July 2020, and I think that was about the lowest for monocrystalline silicon modules. Right now it's 24 cents, so it's rebounded to a level above, uh, above 2019 prices. And so the silicon price is currently $28.5 a kilogram when it was it hit a low of about $8 a kilogram last year. So the, the, the upswing has been drastic, and we do think that it will probably come back down again 2020 was probably below cost for a lot of players so um it will come back down again but probably not quite as low immediately as 2020 prices and carry on reducing from there so the, the big factories are moving to larger format wafers and more efficient module designs so they will keep making those, those technological improvements which is one reason, by the way, that manufa solar manufacturing is a horrible business. Like whenever you want to put manufacturing in Europe, just remember, horrible business, factories are obsolete in five years. It's, it's a hard sell. <laughs> well, a rosy outlook there <laughs> from Jenny. Um, Matthew, what are you seeing in, in your business in terms of project development? Can you quantify the price increases that we have seen recently related to COVID or really a range of issues? I, I could I could tell you that the costs have increased. Unfortunately, I don't have those exact figures to hand. Um, I mean, the the costs have significantly in, increased for us. Um, whereby, to give you an example, one of our suppliers uh, gave us a, a quotation recently where we, we we changed the specification of of the modules for a site, and the difference was the shipping. You know, between free on board. With a, with a previous supplier, we got the same cost then, um, including the, the shipping. Um, so we, we actually saved ourselves the, the entire shipping cost from China. So quite significant. So there are kind of workaways, of a, uh, work workarounds rather, um, available course, to, yeah. to creative developers <laughs> like yourself, uh, Frederica. <laughs> yeah, we actually got um, several more attendee questions. Um, and one is quite broad. Can you compare EU battery production to EU PV module production? Does PV need more subsidies? And... I'm going yeah. to see Johan opening his mouth, so yeah. please <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> I, I, I need more subsidies. Uh, I would say it would be beneficial if we could sort of use uh, the current situation where we direct a lot of funding for uh, recovery of the whole European industry into PV manufacturing. Uh, we have so far mostly discussed in terms of cost, but there are other sort of values that are... Uh, that are, yeah, we can discuss and are, are uh, can be captured. Um, I think last year we had a trade deficit of seven, uh, 2019, uh, of 7.4 billion euros when it comes to PV cells and modules. And if we could capture a bigger part of that value within Europe, we could create jobs. And in the transition, we, we of course need to go from fossil fuels to renewable energy, but we also need to turn have a transition of, of fossil 
jobs to renewable jobs in Europe. Otherwise, we we will have a setback. Um, and I think that's that's one part to be discussed. And uh, I think it's a good possibility now for for Europe to sort of rebuild its PV industry. Um, Naomi mentioned the technology shifts that are taking place, and and we have a um, possibility there in Europe, but also that we have now uh, several different policy uh, instruments that are uh, are aiming at uh, changing the uh, whole European industry from fossil to, uh, to renewable energy. And dear panelists, uh, would you like to add to that? Naomi, yeah. your name was mentioned. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, it's an interesting question. I think what was uh, succeeded in the battery industry and in the European Battery Alliance was not unlocking massive uh, amounts of subsidies, but coordinating really the, the value chain and having really a strategy uh, from the manufacturers to the off-takers. And that was what, that was, what was really uh, succeeded in the, in the Battery Alliance. And I think this is how it's not by a large amount of subsidies that the manufacturing uh, will be reborn, but by a more strategic vision. Um, and and, uh, and I, I think two elements are important here. The first one is really to continue opening the market domestically, uh, which means uh, subsidizing the, the investment into new projects. Uh, but we know that with the cost going down, we have uh, less needs for subsidies. It's also about policies, it's also about permitting, etc. So really opening the markets domestically. Um, and the second thing is investing into manufacturing. But really, the, the idea here is to have public subsidies to, to attract uh, private investors. Uh, I think uh, Gunther Erfurt, for example, uh, estimates the cost uh, to the investment amount for, for cells and modules to uh, 5 to 6 billion uh, more or less, uh, if you compare that to, for example, what is needed for uh, hydrogen uh, production and for the electrolysis industry, it's, it's not a lot actually. It's just investing at the right time and at the right uh, in the in the right uh, industries. Well, and we actually saw was it over two billion in investment for for the North Vault. Uh, venture, um, battery manufacturing venture, um, just yesterday, I believe that, that was announced. So we see there are billions available um, if you're in the right sector. Another question um, from our attendees, this one's directed to you, Jenny. Um, one other argument for manufacturing in Europe is to promote sustainability, not having to fly modules, or rather ship them, I imagine, all the way from China to Europe. Um, I, I imagine you could also, and this is the Made in Europe and Sustainability uh, Roundtable event, um, I imagine you can also have greater scrutiny o over supply chains, which is a kind of hot button issue at the moment. You can do all those things. I think it's worth pointing out that transport is a relatively small part of the carbon emissions of most of the things that we buy. And it would be an incredible shame if solar went back to being a small scale industry because we don't want to use the resources that the world has dedicated to scaling it up massively. Okay, well, th that's the carbon emissions in the shipping. What about uh, the cost? M Matt, over to you. Matthew, you guys are shipping modules or importing modules all the time. How, how does uh, shipments factor into the cost structure? Um, it obviously factors in. Um, we, we, we are mainly an integrator. So, you know, we, we are EPC, DCM. Uh, a lot of the time we are free issued modules as well. So um, these, these factors have to be considered that a lot of the time we are helping to, to develop the sites, but a lot of the time the, um, the, the, the end client is specifying what modules they want to use a lot of the time now. Um, it's, it's, I think that the whole dynamic has, has shifted from where we as an EPC used to, used to uh, design, have the design principle, whereas now the investors are, are a lot more um, on board with, with specifying what, what, what's required. So a lot of the time we, we don't have a, a say necessarily in which models we use. Uh, yes, if we have the availability from, from Europe, we'd, we'd all love to, to reduce um, carbon emissions, to, to reduce uh, shipping costs, et cetera, and, and obviously create jobs within Europe. Um, but how sustainable that business model would be, um, as, as Jenny quite rightly said, you know, a lot of the raw materials come from China. Uh, and I don't think that would change. 
And do you think that European production could um, have an impact or improve uh, just-in-time delivery of modules? This is another question from an attendee. Yes, uh, I absolutely believe that. Um, and, and obviously, we, we would actively promote anything to, to be manufactured in Europe uh, as much as possible uh, or reasonably practicable. Um, but I, I, I don't fully see how, how that's possible. But having said that, the parts availability would massively benefit us as an EPC, but also as an O&M, uh, to, uh, to have parts availability, to have parts available in Europe for a, a you know a, a, a day or, or several day turnaround in, instead of waiting weeks for, for shipping from from China would be a massive benefit for us uh, to reduce our, our stock holding for a start um, and the the end clients or the the um, the SPVs um, contractual spare parts uh, that would massively benefit us to reduce those costs and overheads and and stock holdings um, but will that happen uh, I, I can't honestly tell you. Okay, some more benefits in terms of O and M. I wonder how that works out in terms of uh, additional cost on the module front. Over to you, Frederica. Yeah. Does an um, another attendee question here? Does an IPCE for next generation solar tech makes tech make sense? Um, maybe not for the current uh, techs, but needing a fast implementation. But for future technology, what is your feeling on that? What do you think? Uh, from our side, uh, from the European Solar Manufacturing Council, we believe so, and uh, we are currently uh, that's uh, one of our goals. And we know there's an interest from several companies in Europe for uh, creating an IPSI for PV manufacturing in Europe. So, from our side, yes. But if we, in the end, will have one, that's another question. Fair point. Yeah. Jenny, would you like? Yeah. Oh, Naomi. Would you like Quick to addition, I, I fully agree with uh, what Johan said. Uh, I think I think it's it should be very interesting to have um, IPCIs are in the end European integrated project, right, involving different countries, and that's the type of model that we want for the European industry. So I don't see why this shouldn't be true for the for the solar PV sector. So our Europe has launched an IPCI on uh, solar PV manufacturing a couple of years ago, coupled with hydrogen. So from that experience, I think I can also share that IPCI is also quite heavy project to uh, to set up, but, uh, but we can count on the support of, uh, of the EU um, there. So I hope in the next years will be another IPCI. What we know now is that the uh, European Commission are uh, revi uh, reviewing the IPSA guidelines and they have explicitly mentioned it in its last uh, sort of um, uh, uh, EU industrial strategy. Uh, so uh, I think it's something that uh, now is a good good time to start discussing it um, because we have some at least message from, from the EU Commission that it's uh, a way uh, to work with PV manufacturing in Europe. So we have another attendee question. Um, the, the attendee says, First Solar have just announced that they will add 3.3 gigawatt capacity increase in the US, um, increasing it to a six gigawatt total, um, thus making them the biggest module manufacturer outside China. Um, why can we not do the same as our attendee um, asking in Europe? I think perhaps to Jenny, that's a good one. Yep. <laughs> Maybe because we don't like paying 34 cents a watt for less efficient modules than we're currently getting from, from China for 24 cents. So it's I really mean, that there's this uh, giant price delta between the US and Europe. There is. Uh, so Americans love paying for stuff. Um, it's, that's just the way it is. Um, their residential systems cost over $2.50 a watt, whereas in Germany, they're about $1.50 equivalent, slightly higher right now. Um, and modules, the, the, the import tariffs in the US mean that solar modules cost $0.34 cents relative versus $0.24 cents factory gate. And I don't know whether... <laughs> Would it kill the industry? No, it wouldn't. Solar is now so cheap that it could carry on building at 34 cents, and in fact is doing in the US, but they do have a massive federal subsidy that's in, in, in place for a long time. But do we want to handle that kind of, of completely unnecessary cost increases? I'm not sure we do. 
Okay, and uh, another question. It's, it, it, is it to be expected that the EU will introduce supply chain transparency regulations as well as CO2 footprint requirements that will bring advantages to EU manufacturing? Any ideas about the timeline for such regulations? Now, Ami, as a, as a policy wonk, what, what insights do you have there? <laughs> Uh, yeah, we, we know that uh, the EU will take action on uh, on due diligence. Uh, that's uh, that's for sure. Uh, it's also, uh, I mean, we, you know that we will have the entry into force of uh, eco design requirements in a couple of years, and we've been contributing. The topic of uh, of the transparency, at least on CO two content, uh, will be will be one topic. Yeah. Um, maybe just to react quickly on what Jenny said, I, I think I think you point out to the to the real question here, the, the cost competitiveness, and and I think the, the the manufacturing story should not come at the cost of uh, um, of the cost competitiveness of solar modules for developers. That's for sure. Now we also see that there are other considerations in terms of uh, added value. I mean, the, uh, of added value of manufacturing uh, in the EU. The, Having having manufacturing locally is also resources for governments, and and I think that's something that all governments, it's not only Europe, but it's also US and India, are considering when they're reinvesting into manufacturing capacities. Uh, and another thing is also a geostrategic consideration that uh, Matthew I think expressed uh, well uh, in terms of uh, of access to to technology. Okay, Matthew King from uh, Belletric, I want to bring you back in to the conversation. Um, you know, we were talking, it was mentioned supply chains a number of times and, and also ESG principles. What, what kind of yeah. traction are you seeing? You're working with investors every day. Um, what kind of pull factor are you seeing from investors in terms of ESG and sustainable products and practices? Yeah, absolutely. Certainly, certainly from um, a, an O&M perspective, um, probably more so uh, from a loan perspective, we are already having traction with some of our clients for ESG. So we monitor our uh, the, the time we spend driving, the, the necessity of driving the site. We report back our mileage figures, you know, the the, the average um, hours worked, etc. We have a whole a whole ream of um, reporting that, that we give back to some of our clients already on how we react to issues, you know. This brings into you know digitalization of, of O&M largely, where you know we are reducing our carbon footprint by driving less, um, traveling less, um, and you know not necessarily tra traveling with with multiple vehicles to site. So, so from an O&M perspective, we we already have or we we're making traction with a lot of our larger clients with that, and as such, the the, the rest of our O&M business globally. Um, from, a, from a, uh, an EPC, we are making uh, progress with that. Um, but like you say, we, we, we don't necessarily dictate where we can get parts from. Uh, it, it's cost-driven, it's investor-driven. So, um, so from that perspective, we, uh, we are reducing it as much as we can. But yeah, it, it, it could be driven further. And, and by, by supplying from EU, that, that could have have, have more traction as well, but uh, like I say, we are we are dictated to uh, largely from where we have to purchase our, our parts from currently. Okay. So well, we we you know we we have to buy parts from somewhere. Um, they they're already specified a lot of the time if we're an EPCM. So um, we 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 do our best, but unfortunately, we are currently dictated to quite a lot. Well, this is the Made in Europe and Sustainability Roundtable session, so I think that's a good point to leave our discussion on. Thank you, Johan Lindahl of uh, the European Solar Manufacturing Council, Naomi Chevilla of Solar Power Europe, Jenny Chase from Bloomberg NEF, and Matthew King of The Electric. Thank you very Thanks much, everyone. everyone, for your time. And thank you for our great questions also. It's fantastic to see so many of those coming through. Again, more than we could get to, but please don't hesitate to keep sending your questions throughout the discussion today. Well, having explored some of the arguments as to why Made in Europe may be important, in our next panel discussion, we'll be turning our attention to the technologies, financing, and supporting policies that will be required to make these European production ambitions a reality. But before that, we're going to hear from two European technology leaders, one of which has some very ambitious manufacturing plans.
Well, over the last two years, Maya Berger CEO Gunter Alfred has emerged as a leading and forceful uh, voice for made in, Euro uh, made in Europe and also made in Germany PV cell and module production. He previously served as the CTO of the company while it was a leading production equipment supplier in Europe and Asia. The last major cell technology investment cycle was for PERC upgrades, and Maya Burger played an important role. Since then, the company has argued that the combination of heterojunction and smart wire is the logical next step for increased cell and module efficiencies, and indeed, it's the technology choice Maya Berger is pursuing as the first modules roll off its German production lines, really, as we speak. Gunter Alfred, welcome to Roundtables Europe. It's great to have you a part of the discussion today. Good morning, Jonathan. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, we've seen quite a lot of lively discussion. It is a very multifaceted issue, developing uh, production PV cell and module production in Europe. You're in the business of actually doing it. Um, can you take us through where you're at at this stage and, and what plans you have? I, I can certainly uh, do this. Um, so um, I did listen also to the, to the previous round and uh, what, I, what I found a bit... Um, um, at least interesting is that it was uh, basically a, 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 a one and only discussion. You know, uh, it was discussed uh, should manufacturing only be in Europe or should we not source anything from China at all? I think that's not at all the question. The question really is uh, what we can do about uh, differentiation, and that's exactly my bogus point. So we will come in uh, with a completely new product, um, providing simply a super competitive levelized cost of electricity. Um, um, option uh, to customers both in residential uh, in the first place, but uh, we will eventually also enter into utility. It's it's not only about the module price. I think that was uh, that was um, um, that's that's something that um, needs to be better understood in our opinion. If we look into uh, residential, uh, the, the module makes uh, less than thirty percent of the total invest in utility. It's a bit higher. But that also explains what, what, what leverage one might have if you use a highly efficient solar module uh, uh, compared to a standard module because it dilutes also the cost structure of the downstream. And that's exactly what we do. Um, we, we are now um, ramping our, our initial drop in the ocean, 400 megawatt uh, small tiny capacity. It's 0.1% of the global market share expected for 2021. So it's nothing in other, in other terms. And that also um, uh, brings me to the next um, uh, core element of our strategy. We don't want to stay tiny. We want to grow as fast as we can into a multi-gigawatt uh, player uh, with a leading technology and with a unique business model also because there's no other company uh, on the planet until so far at least that combines technology development, production equipment, industrialization and production, and last but not least, the end product, the solar module. Okay. So let me let me share a few slides with you, um, which should be visible now. Um, all right. So Maya Borger, I, I don't think I need to explain too much about the company. Maybe only the fact that Maya Borger is uh, doing photovoltaic since 1981, when uh, when Passan started its business until today, a leading company in IV measurement. Um, and Jonathan said it. Uh, correctly, we have been driving many technology standards in the industry, and I, what I would like to emphasize again, we did not only supply the equipment, we supplied the entire technology, uh, which was then uh, uh, bought by basically all players um, on the market, and that also explains why we are differentiating in future, because um, today you can either buy a perk product or you can, you can leave it, uh, with a very few exceptions only. So what you buy today on the market is ex always exactly the same product, regardless of uh, what supplier you, you choose from, because it's all based on the same technology. And that's what we are ending now in this captive model using our own technology. So we have... Uh, uh, last year, uh, raised um, equity uh, money uh, that we that we were using to implement the first 400 megawatt, and we are working towards um, uh, uh, the next growth phase, which will be 1.4 gigawatt production that we expect to um, that we have reached end of 2023. Um, 
And we will move on from there, um, uh, approaching five gigawatt by 2026. And here also, you know, coming back to the previous uh, discussion, uh, it is a very, very small uh, portion of the global supply. And uh, I think the aim should not be that, uh, uh, that uh, Europe creates its own isolated market. I think that's not, not the strategy. It shouldn't be the strategy. It's a global competition, clearly, and we believe uh, we can we can we can we can fit uh, right into that, uh, given the elements that I that I already explained. Um, so we did open the factory for the cell line on May the 18th. Just a few impressions here. Um, I also would like to emphasize that Maya Borger uh, needed eight months to create something that other companies um, uh, named their core business. Um, um, and I believe, uh, I shouldn't say it's, it's easy to do, but it's absolutely doable uh, to do that uh, in, a, in, a, in a fast track approach. Um, also here another impression from the opening of the module line. Um, and so as we speak, we are ramping the line and uh, we have uh, sold the product already successfully in Europe. There are installations ongoing uh, or, or in, in the works, in the planning works. And um, from July, we will ship the product to our customers. Um, the product itself, I mentioned it, uh, it's having a much, much higher uh, performance, which will uh, provide us the option to also um, ask for a, for a value-based uh, higher price uh, for the product and still providing the customer with the same level as cost of electricity or even better than with uh, standard Asian products today. Highest quality, also this is a, is a topic uh, which, uh, which needs to be um, uh, focused on. Um, the aesthetics are great for the residential. It's a made in Germany, it's uh, Swiss technology based. It's a sustainable product in terms of um, our recycling approaches. Uh, we have a circular economy a recycling approach uh, as opposed to what's standard today. Uh, we can reuse 98% of the, of the module's components and the module is entirely lead free, which is um, also very rare on this planet. Um, most of the panels that you buy today contain um, more lead than actually would be allowed under the European rows. Uh, PV is exempt. Um, uh, we'll see for how long, um, because it's going to be a waste problem. And um, the, what we are also uh, seeing as a, as a uniqueness in Mayaborga is uh, that we can not only go into the rooftop um, um, premium segment, but also based on the very high yields of our product into utility, um, and we don't need to compete at, you know, the 19 cents or the 20 cents because, uh, as I said, at the end of the day, what matters is levelized cost of electricity and not the module price. The module price is a smaller component of the investment. And the higher efficient the module is, the more you can dilute the total cost um, uh, of ownership or levelized cost of electricity of a system. That's exactly um, the game we play. And focus markets will be Europe, US, as we speak, and uh, Australia and Japan eventually, but we would also not refrain from, uh, you know, selling into other markets um, 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 in the midterm. Um, so the market share, I spoke already about this year with the 400 uh, megawatt uh, only. This is super tiny and it continues to be small uh, despite our gigawatt plans. Um, what's important also to, to, to understand in PV it is simply not true that you need um, 20 gigawatts of manufacturing capacity in order to run a production um, competitively. Um, you can, you can um, uh, easily calculate bottom up that, you that, it, that what is required is a capacity of about 1.5 to 2 gigawatts uh, in order to reach an optimal cost structure. Um, and higher production capacities can even be a burden and uh, looking at the wafer prices, for instance, uh, the wafer prices are pretty much the same for everyone um, on the planet. So I compare this to going to a gas station. It, it doesn't matter if you go there <laughs> with your moped or um, a large truck, you pay the same uh, per gallon or per liter. And it's pretty similar also for, for wafers and other components. Um, and um, this, is, this is super important to understand this, uh, that the supply chain is, is pretty much optimized um, or ha has been optimized throughout the last decade and further cost reductions uh, will be more or less uh, associated with technology improvements, higher efficiencies, substituting, uh, minimizing the use of expensive materials, thinning the wafers as good as you can, taking out silver, all of those components and that's exactly where we have our strength um, as a technology developer. 
Uh, we are selling through a, a three, three stage approach uh, with distributors. We have, um, we have um, signed uh, contracts with the leading uh, wholesale companies um, in Europe, but also in the US, um, and are selling through this, uh, through the standard approach, if you will, and that's uh, that's going uh, uh, very very well. We are in the, in the market since six weeks, and um, I couldn't be more happy with it, with the success until so far. Um, and last but not least, I mentioned it many many times. We have to we have to uh, move away from the pure focus on dollar per watt peak. This is simply not the entire truth. It's important, but it's not the entire truth. What matters at the end of the day is levelized cost of electricity. And uh, it has to do with the investment, with the dollar per watt peak, but not only. It has uh, moreover to do with the energy yields, and uh, we are focusing and consistently implementing our R&D roadmap. We have a next generation heterojunction technology in the works in a proprietary approach again with a patented technology um, captive model. Nobody will see the equipment any, any longer uh, that we are using, and we have already tested the new technology achieving um, module test module efficiencies of way above 24% module, not cell efficiency, module efficiency. And we are working on tandem. We are working on new product applications. And um, again, we do this all within our unique um, captive business model and uh, very, very much believe and are convinced um, of our success in the future. Thank you. Gunter Erfurt, CEO of Meyer Burger. As I said in the introduction, a forceful voice for Made in Germany and Made in Europe production. Thank you very much for your time today. Of course, I always have a lot more questions, but we have run out of time. I understand that you will be joining or endeavoring to join the German networking session. So any of our German speakers who are on the stream today, I do encourage you to go over to that at the end of this event and put your questions directly to Gunter Erfurt, CEO of Meyer Burger. Thank you again. Now, um, moving on, still continuing our focus, however, on technology. For European production to be competitive, it must be able to scale efficiently to gigawatts of capacity and readily transfer technology improvements from R&D into volume manufacturing. German production equipment supplier von Adena argues that its production platforms allow exactly for this. And Sebastian Gutz, the company's VP for photovoltaics, is here to make the case for PVD and also Fonodena's production platforms for Topcon, Heterojunction and Perovskite tandem cells. Sebastian, welcome to our Made in Europe and sustainability session today. Hi, Jonathan. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's a great pleasure. And it, it is nice that we're going a little bit deeper in terms of production because for European cell production to be able to scale, it really needs to be right on the cutting edge when it comes to cost and also efficiency. That's correct, yeah, and thanks also for the opportunity to give uh, uh, the perspective of an equipment supplier on, on, on that. And here is my presentation about gigawatt scale production equipment for high efficiency cells. So um, here just, to, just a reminder, I think everybody is aware about the graph on the left hand side where the well known price decreased in the last 15 years coming uh, there where the main drivers for this was the continuously efficiency improvement. Uh, as well as the scaling and the higher throughputs of the equipment itself. So von Adene contributed as a PVD supplier um, significantly to the price decrease for the thin film photovoltaics. And in order to, to achieve also higher efficiencies for crystalline, more than 24%, uh, we are convinced that PVD is the right choice also to uh, apply here, either for heterojunction, is it for Topcon, IBC or tandem structures. But coming, um, uh, Charles, uh, re, uh, comment on our company, as you mentioned, we are a, a family-owned company uh, in the third generation. Uh, Pia von Adene Lichtenberg is the granddaughter of the founder. We are a global company with 1,000 uh, employees worldwide, uh, more than 600 uh, in Germany. And um, we apply uh, different uh, markets, right? So here on the left-hand side, you see that, uh, or here on the screen, you see that uh, the sustainability at all is an important topic for us. So uh, we are working daily to create more sustainable uh, uh, future by enabling solar cell and module manufacturers uh, to produce in gigawatt scale, uh, but also glass coating companies to manufacture energy saving window glasses, um, uh, or also battery companies to create efficient storage uh, solutions. 
In addition to the fact that our systems ensure uh, our customers the highest levels of efficiency uh, um, in, in, in use of consumables and energy in their production, we ensure by different measures also to work sustainable at our own production facility. We apply, for example, an energy monitoring system which allows economically energy consumption or apply closed cooling water circuits in order to reuse the heat which is generated during tests of our equipment. At our headquarters in Germany, uh, we're building rooftop facades are using for the generation of solar electricity by means of solar panels. This electricity is then uh, used for self-consumption and fed into the grid and so on and so forth. And so forth. But coming back to as a, our topic for equipment manufacturer, uh, we support our customer from small uh, to middle to uh, large scale. So starting from R&D and pilot production to evaluate new processes, materials, applications, uh, going to the high volume manufacturing uh, uh, systems where we uh, installed more than 200 PVD systems for the high volume manufacturing system in the PV market. And here one example, uh, let me show, introduce you our Xeanova platform for heterojunction mass production. This carrier-based inline uh, system enables double side coating for the transparent conductive oxide, which is important here. Um, and thereby the system allows very defined temperature control during the whole process. The modular platform design enables also an efficient installation procedure and high uptime, as well as a possibility for future upgrades. Um, on the next slide, you do see also that uh, we have a continuous increase in the throughput uh, um, of the systems. Uh, the scaling um, reduces uh, not only the capex, but also the opex. Um, here you see, starting from 5,500, uh, this year uh, we do apply system with 10,000, and next year we plan 12,000 wafer per hour throughput in order to increase um, uh, the, the, the um, throughput. Um, our whole center inline system is also ready for all wafer sizes, including M10, G12, or even half cut cells. And here you do see the results on CAPEX and OPEX. Uh, in OPEX, you reduce uh, for one gigawatt production, it's a factor of more than 20%, uh, but also the CAPEX is reduced of up to 60%. If you apply systems with higher throughput here, up to 10,000 wafer per hour system, you need just two systems to uh, apply one gigawatt. But, as I said before, uh, throughput is not everything. Um, you need to make sure that all the efficiency is con continuously improving. So our customers are now achieving, uh, with our systems, efficiencies more than 24% and going to the 25% direction with an excellent open circuit voltage of more than 740 millivolt and also the edge exclusion on the right-hand side, you see it's very small uh, to achieve very high efficiencies. And then you see here a comparison between um, uh, different applications here, the reference uh, process from a customer and uh, without Fonadene PVD system and on the right hand side, different processes with our PVD systems. Um, so applying a dual layer coating, we are able to uh, increase the efficiency in an average of 0.46%. And this is achieved all with a continuous development of the TCO coating itself. Um, so high mobility and, uh, and also high transparency with low conductive, uh, conductive uh, resistance to the underlying uh, amorphous silicon layer and to the contact width on top, uh, the holy grail, uh, which need to be achieved in, in the gigawatt production. And this is also done with our um, uh, magnetron technology. We do have our own development and production of the magnetrons where you have very high uh, utilization of the material itself, uh, up to 85%, and uh, homogeneous thickness homogeneity over the whole size of the uh, carrier systems. But TCO is not on heterotrunk, is not the only one. There's also PVD coatings for copper plating um, needed. So a seed layer for the copper plating approach, applying the same platform, going uh, to replace uh, maybe silver and in the, at the end. Uh, which is a challenge in the in the production in the, in, in, in the gigawatt scale. So here we are ready to um, uh, to support this proven uh, um, technology on on the coating itself. And last but not least, I also want to give you a, a, a brief update about the new big things in in, in the R and D world going to tandem photovoltaics. 
Um, in order to bring this to Gigawatt, there are a lot of uh, uh, challenges to be solved and uh, R&D and pilot production customers are working on it. You see it here on the left-hand side. I do not want to uh, go all through it, but I just want to say that PVD processes are able to tackle all these challenges. And here you see an example on the right-hand side of system uh, doing on a, on a uh, uh, wafer to wafer based uh, processes, um, applying uh, the top cell just in the vacuum and achieving uh, high efficiencies, transferring the record cells in laboratory to, um, to wafer based cells. And then we have, do have other customers who are doing this technology, bringing in already to um, um, uh, uh, inline production with maybe a couple of hundreds of wafer per hour throughput to evaluate this uh, uh, technology to go in a couple of, uh, let's say, one, two years to, to uh, higher um, capacity in the direction of gigawatt. So this brings me uh, to the end. I don't need to repeat all the things, but want to invite you also to show, um, uh, to go to, uh, to the link on the left-hand side, you see where you can see a, a virtual reality experience uh, with our Xeanova system and um, feel free to see and uh, contact us if there are any uh, further questions. Sebastian Gatz, Thanks. thank you very much for that. Just very quickly, you did mention Perovskite. How much activity are you seeing in Perovskite development uh, in Europe? So in Europe, uh, there are a lot of uh, um, uh, developments going on due to the fact that Hydrojunction and, and, and Perk Topcon are uh, from R&D side solved. It's now just a question of scaling. And all these experience uh, institutes and R&D facilities have now the new task to provide, to, to go for, for tandem technology. Um, and as I said here, scaling is one topic, um, is stability is the, the other one, the process flow, to find a process flow which works in, in pilot, but also a cost-effective process flow for high volume manufacturing. These are the challenges. There are a lot of uh, activities going on and and and. The European R&D world is, is the right one to, to tackle all these challenges and, and bring the next step out of Europe uh, in, in this regard. Well, a promising future for these new technologies. I'd love to talk more with you about the copper plating for heterojunction, but we'll have to do that another time because we are out of time. Sebastian Gatz, Vice President Photovoltaics for Fonadena, thank you for joining our Made in Europe and Sustainability session today. Thanks, Jonathan. We've had two visions from a technology standpoint for solar made in Europe. And uh, supply chains play an important role, which is why we will hear more from the sustainability expert Lubomila Jordanova. She's going to share her experiences and learnings from other industry. So we will pop that solar bubble and get an outside perspective to grow our own. Yeah, it's great to get perspectives from outside of solar sometimes. But before that, our next panel discussion, let's go deeper into how made in Europe can be made to happen. What products could potentially cut through, how they can be constructed, made, and also how getting to the manufacturing scale required can be financed. Because one thing is clear, it's going to take many hundreds of millions of euros, and as we heard uh, earlier, some billions of euros for it to become a reality. And to discuss how Made in Europe PV production can be competitive, we have invited these four experts. Director of Analysis at Exawood, Alex Barrows. Alex focuses on when and how te new technologies will influence the PV market and oversees PV market data analysis. Vartan Oskanian, advisor to the CEO of Recom, an established European module maker. Vartan himself brings over 30 years of international experiences to the French company. Laura Satore, managing director at Ecoprogetti, the Italian company delivers turnkey production lines for module manufacturers. Last but not least, Eterna Zocco, executive director of clean energy technology at IHS Market. Eterna has been involved in the solar industry for more than a decade, offering sector insights and market data to develop company individual growth strategies, market entry plans and competitive analysis. Welcome everyone. Great to see you all. <laughs> Let's kick off the discussion straight away. Alex, we've been talking a lot about European production. We've seen Maya Borga's plans. These are actually happening. But of course, we have existing module manufacturing here in Europe. Can you kind of give us an update as to what's the status at the moment? What is the status quo? Yeah, thanks, Jonathan. Um, 
So at, at the moment, Europe really does best at the two ends of the, the value chain. So polysilicon uh, with Bacher in Germany being one of the, the few companies in Europe with a, a sort of globally significant level of capacity. And then at the other end, at the module level, there are actually quite a large number of small module manufacturers in Europe. Uh, and then a sort of a few larger ones, such as Recon. Uh, and sort of by the end of this year, if you include Turkey, we're probably looking at about 10 gigawatts or so of module capacity in Europe. Um, but the utilization on that varies very widely. So some of that is, is sort of very significantly underutilized. Um, and then the intervening steps, there's really a, a bit of a missing link. So at the wafer level, uh, there's a couple of companies in Norway making the most of the, the cheap and green hydroelectricity there for their ingot and wafer manufacturing. Um, and at Cell, uh, again, it's sort of a few small manufacturers, a little bit of perk in Turkey, but out, outside of that, you're really looking at relatively small heterojunction manufacturers looking to differentiate themselves from the Chinese giants. So at both wafer and Cell, you're really in the, the sort of one to two gigawatt range in terms of total capacity for the region. Well, then, as you mentioned, the module makers, um, their team, they, they, there does tend to be um, a, a larger group of module makers, and, and we've been hearing that in 2021 and even later in the year in 2020, there were upgrades um, occurring right across the European module producer landscape. Adona Zocco, um, why is it that you think these module makers have had more success than the cell makers on the other side? Uh, well, Jonathan, I mean, I don't think we can gen generalize in the sense that Alex was saying before, uh, you know, there have been some manufacturers that have been more successful than others. And uh, But I would say that one of the factors that is helping the growth of manufacturers and uh, the success of manufacturers in Europe is the fact that the local market has been growing uh, by double digits in the last few years. And the expectation is that is going to continue to grow uh, in the next uh, in the next year. So it is very important for the success of uh, manufacturers in Europe that the local market uh, is, it is strong and that the current uh, situation in terms of demand. Uh, for those companies that have been more successful, uh, as some previous speakers were mentioning, I would say that's a combination of different factors. One is that uh, the, the manufacturers, uh, European manufacturers have been especially successful in those markets where there is some sort of local content or a carbon footprint um, mechanism that helps them in terms of uh, competitiveness. Uh, another factor that uh, is helping uh, manufacturers to be successful is that uh, for the most part, they have been prioritizing the rooftop segment that uh, it is less price sensitive and where the total uh, cost of the of the module in terms of the, of the installation capex is much smaller. So that's definitely a segment that is more accessible for, for European manufacturers compared to, to utility. And then um, another factor is, is that most uh, manufacturers are not focusing on the standard, on the standard products or per, but rather moving into the higher end uh, technologies that also that will give them more, more leverage and more uh, uh, opportunities to compete to compete against uh, the large uh, Chinese uh, model makers. Okay, thank you for that, Adone. And I do encourage everyone to send through your questions. Perhaps we can have them up on the monitors in the studio now so I can feed them into the discussion. Laura, over to you. From a production equipment supplier standpoint, you've been very active um, in supplying uh, European module makers and, of course, module makers elsewhere with the new equipment to uh, adjust to this major development we've seen in cell sizes. Um, can you kind of describe what it is um, you've seen from the module? makers from a production standpoint in terms of how they've been able to be competitive and maintain their competitiveness over time? Yes. Hi, hi Jonathan. So uh, clearly mm, what we have seen in the manufacturers uh, mm, is that the level of automation clearly is one of the first topics that in Europe uh, get the benefit. But not, not only automation, but Customize automation and uh, automation integrated with the logistic. Uh, as you know, uh, nowadays automation cost is getting lower and lower. And but what increases is the percentage and the incidence on the logistic uh, factor. Uh, 
uh, in the production of the PV model. So logistics now become an issue, handling the logistic. Uh, so clearly, it's not only having an automation, but having an integrated automation with some innovation that can uh, integrate better with the logistic uh, uh, feeding of the raw material. And the other very, very important aspect is the flexibility. I think, uh, as Edern said uh, before, and also all the other people I've been listening to the panels before, the local uh, topic is not only about uh, the production or the location of the production, but is also knowing the, the, the local market. So what we are seeing is that the manufacturers also of standard PV uh, slightly adjust their production line make the production line flexible to a specific type of panel. So the product identity, some, some automations linked with the product identity, I would say. So um, it's clear every producer knows his own market. Uh, in Germany, the roofs are not made in the same way like in Italy, uh, unfortunately. I mean, we are within Europe, but the roofs are very different, uh, even the industrial roofs. So there is a lot of difference between a panel which is perfect for Germany, perfect for Hungary, perfect for Netherlands, which is again another type of roof. Uh, so this type of slight difference between panel to panel have to be reflected in the product identity. And what we do with the production line is also to uh, follow this product identity need for the producer, for the manufacturer, and adjust with some slight flexibility uh, the production line in order to have some differentiation factor which guarantee a competitive advantage for the manufacturer product identity. I haven't heard that phrase before, <laughs> but I, I, it's great to have it part of the discussion. Um, and and Vartan, I'll bring you in into our discussion now. It's great to have a module maker actually um, I, as a part of, of this discussion. Can you give me a bit of an update? Where is Recom at in terms of your module production? And I, I know you had uh, cell production plans in the past. Um, any chance that they'll be revived? Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, well, Recom has been in the renewables since 2007, but more profoundly in the PV cell and module manufacturing since acquisition of Recom's own cell and module production facilities in Padua, Italy, and Lannion, France, in 2015 and 2017, respectively. Well, our capacities today are 250 megawatt cell, and 450 megawatt module in France. We also do Asian production, bringing our annual capacity to around one gigawatt with cells in more than 90 countries. So we have presence on both sides of the, the geographic divide, so to speak, Europe and Asia. And uh, we've been engaged, touched, affected, influenced, guided by all aspects of the industry technology production, competition, national legislations, procurement, what have you. Even during this not very long period, since 2007, we've been through all sorts of trials and tribulations. We've seen the good times and the bad times, ups and downs. Now that I try to answer your specific question about our status, let me put it in the context of our general topic of discussion today sustainability and competitiveness of European-made models. But I think Europe today is at a crossroads. So are we, the renewable industry. And we look to Brussels and to national capitals for direction and guidance. Well, of course, we're never at a standstill. We always keep pace with market development and even try to stay ahead of the curve. We recently introduced Oh, it appears that we've had a bit of an internet glitch. We'll see if we can get that back up and running soon. Always a bit of a danger with online events, aren't they, Frederica? But we do have questions from our audience, so let's get on to those first, and we'll come back to Vatan as soon as we can. Okay. But let's start, get started with one of our audience questions. Um, and one, the audience member is referring back to the presentation of Gunther Erfurt, who said, um, from Maya Burger, who said that small production factories can be pr um, competitive. And the attendee is asking if you, our dear panelists, agree. Are bigger factories more environmentally friendly? That's two opposing questions. But do you agree um, small factories can be competitive or are bigger production f um, facilities more environmentally friendly? Maybe to one of our analysts. Alex, jump yeah. in there. Come on. 
Yeah, so I think to, to split the questions into two, one, one can, make, can they be competitive and two, can they be environmentally friendly? Uh, I mean, the environmentally friendly aspect I don't think is particularly a, a function of size. Um, so, for example, if you look at some of those Norwegian wafer manufacturers, they've sort of carved out a niche for themselves as low CO2 manufacturers, and they are, you know, sort of a gigawatt in scale against uh, long gear, 85 gigawatts or so. Um, and that's mostly a function of, of where the electricity that they're using comes from. And the, the same with poly production as well. It's mostly a function of, of where your energy is coming from rather than how big you are. Um, and then what processes you're using. So I, I don't think from a from a CO2 and a sustainability point of view, I don't think it's a particular problem to be small. Competitiveness, it, it's harder to compete if you want to compete on a standard product if you're small in some ways. Um, certainly having the buying power of a 30 gigawatt cell facility uh, is handy. Um, but, but that's where it sort of comes back to this word that we've heard a lot of today of differentiation, uh, which is, you know, really the key that a lot of European manufacturers are, have, have looked at and continue to look at. Um, and it's being a step ahead of those sort of 30 to 50 gigawatt manufacturers, um, which is a difficult place to be because you have to balance a, a tightrope of being far enough ahead that you have an edge and you can differentiate your products, but not so far ahead that you're producing something that's economically uncompetitive. Um, so, so it's doable, but it is a challenging place to be. Um, but, but that's where it doesn't matter so much if you're small. And Laura, I might jump in. What are the kind of projects that yeah. you've been um, supplying in Europe in terms of size? Can you give us a bit of a picture there? Yes. Uh, actually, I have also to disagree about the fact that, that a small producer cannot be competitive. And we have to understand what means small, uh, because, of course, uh, I think a 200, 300 megawatt capacity line is not to be considered totally small. Of course, uh, with China, uh, with the comparison with China, it may look like, definitely. But if we look to Alex number what is the production capacity in Europe at the moment uh, it's not so it's not so small uh, recently we've been installing quite many lines uh, with the size which is between 150 to 300 megawatt with some peaks in 600 megawatts so uh, kind of huge line structuring up uh, in the central Europe uh, in East Europe uh, uh, also in um, in um, uh, in the in France region, French, France. Sorry, yeah. So basically, um, I have to disagree to the fact that a small producer cannot be competitive because, uh, as everybody knows, the price of the raw material are kind of um, mainstream at the moment. So it's it's a commodity. Everybody can can source in the main market uh, a small or big quantity of raw material. Uh, some production which are more um, quick to adjust and to react, maybe they are smaller, but they have a high speed rotation and they buy and in the main market the raw material with, uh, with competitive price, with a good management, they are able to react to the mar market shifti shifting, which is quite, uh, <laughs> quite quick at the moment continuously. Uh, they can be competitive and uh, they have the same pricing uh, if, of course, it's more linked to the financial strength than uh, the price. Uh, if you buy one gigawatt or if you buy 200 megawatts, definitely. Uh, you don't have such big price effect uh, if you buy one gigawatt or uh, of raw material or 200 megawatt. The point is which financial condition you have uh, with the purchasing of the raw material. Uh, in, in other times, uh, the automation it's guarantee a very, very low cost of the manpower, uh, both for a huge line and for a small line. So also small manufacturers can really achieve low cost and low incidence of manpower costs along the line. And they can achieve the same high quality as a one gigawatt producer, because at the very end, uh, they have all the inline controls. Each and every step is monitored along the line. And CapEx-wise, as we said, the cost of automation is decreasing significantly day by day. So, okay, apart from the, the, <laughs> the jump of the raw material right now, but uh, it, the automation is getting more and more available uh, to everybody. And yeah, um, regarding the line production, I can't disclose too much, but of course, uh, the sizes are between, I would say, 300 to 400 megawatt. These are the most, uh, the more chosen size at the moment in Europe. 
Okay, thank you, Laura. We've got more questions from our attendees. Yes, we do. Um, so, Adjana, I think this one goes out to you. Um, where's the best place to put a module production? Um, what resources in terms of infrastructure, such as electricity, water, traffic, um, d do you need or are needed? And does green energy um, factor in at all? I mean, uh, within Europe, uh, there is, uh, I mean, probably Laura knows some more about this, uh, but uh, uh, I think, uh, you know, whenever you have access to, uh, to, to the market and wherever you have, uh, you know, uh, proximity to, to the supply chain and, and to, to the customers, of course, if there is any, any program or any uh, support, uh, you know, in building the, the manufacturing, or uh, that will also be extremely helpful to to decide. Uh, it also depends what kind of factory we are talking about. It's going to be like a factory that is more energy intense, uh, depending on the node uh, that we are talking about, or we are talking more about a module assembly uh, factory. So it really depends on what kind of uh, state or part of the supply chain we we are talking about. And Alex, we have the next question for you. Um, the attendee said, asks upstream the cells and um, upstream cells and module production. What are the perspectives for uh, a local production of ingots and wafers in Europe, except for Norsen? Um, is there any environmental advantage to produce in European countries with low carbon electricity? Uh, there can be to some extent. Um, so, for example, if you look at the polysilicon production in China, some of that is heavily fueled by coal, uh, ironically. But there are moves to shift that towards more hydro production. Um, so, so there potentially can be advantages. It depends a bit on uh, the specifics of the company. At the moment, I wouldn't anticipate a significant growth in uh, ingot and wafer production in Europe, but it, it would be feasible um you know it's it's an area it's a bit harder with wafers themselves because they're easy to ship compared to modules modules aren't that efficient to pack into a shipping container so there's especially with high shipping rates at the moment there's a sort of bit of an advantage for localized module production that doesn't quite stack up as well with wafers themselves um so it is more challenging to some extent uh i mean there may be opportunities through new technologies with uh, you know companies that are in Europe looking at curveless um, I've always been a bit skeptical about that in the past um, but some of them have processes that I think are a bit more interesting than, than we've seen from curveless technologies in the past uh, some the, the Norwegian producers have carved out a nice niche in terms of low co2 wafers and I think we, there's certainly opportunity for more of that um, and I think that's a a good selling point potentially uh, in combination with the differentiation of something like heterojunction. Uh, but yeah, I, I wouldn't anticipate a large scale ingot and wafer sort of growth of that industry in Europe unless we get a real sort of strategic view in terms of politicians in Europe deciding to support an entire supply chain, partly because the cell manufacturing isn't here as well. So so it's a challenge to make a jump to to expand a lot of wafer capacity if you know that your cell customers are not going to be here as well. Um, whereas obviously the module makers are close to the market that they're selling into here. Um, so hopefully at some point we'll see political leaders in Europe take a, a more sort of strategic view of the industry in the same way as China has done. Um, but we'll have to wait and see whether that happens. Well, then we are seeing increased scrutiny on supply chains, and you know, in the US, they are the the industry association. There is uh, is very active in terms of um, increasing uh, uh, transparency, supply chain transparency, and that also means local production to some extent. Vasan, I th I see that we have you back. Can I can I now um, uh, hand the floor over to you? You were kind of talking about um, the, you know these bigger pictures about what juncture we find ourselves at in Europe at the moment. Moment, policy is going to play a key role. What, what is your message there as a European manufacturer? Yes, the point I was trying to make that uh, so far what we're doing, working and innovating within a same uh, technology range, we're cutting the cell 
first to half, then triple, now shingle that we've done with Puma, which produces higher uh, efficiency. We play with the bus bars uh, from six to multi, smart, what have you. So the next leap, to make the next leap uh, for companies like ours, uh, need to have clear vision of our leaders on national level and European Union level to see where the policy is heading so that companies like ours will dare to make the necessary investment to make that leap and commercialize the new technologies such as the head for junction. We were among the first recom, although being average uh, European production, we were among the first to contemplate the idea of putting the Gigafab in France. We worked with Meyerberger, we worked with the French Technology Research Institute, uh, INES, uh, and we developed the whole plan the French government's response was lukewarm, and I hope that in this post-COVID period, as the European Union uh, economic recovery is also being viewed within the context of green energy and energy transition, the stars will align and we will see a more visionary approach to the future of solar in, in Europe. Let me make an important point here. Look, uh, the writing is on the wall for all of the world and particularly Europe. Europe has been dependent on oil for the whole life of its existence. Now, as we're moving to a transition to green uh, energy, it is the right time to think about energy independence. Now we're too reliant on China. There is now seven and a half, eight billion euros trade deficit on modules alone. Uh, between Europe and China or the rest of the world. Europe produces only 4% of the module uh, consumption in the world. So there's a lot of room in terms of need and possible production capacity. So the European Union must think, uh, I think, uh, to devise a policy that could balance between promoting European production and not getting into isolationism on trade matters. The right policy at this particular moment, I think, will be extremely important. Europe needs to sustain its own value chain for modules because that's going to be the future. And if we will meet the Paris Accord targets and goals, Europe needs to have a more independent production of solar value chain from uh, ingots uh, all the way through the final production of the module. Well, a very forceful message there. We've just got a couple of minutes left. Um, Vartan is saying, you know, this is the time, this is the right time for this investment to be made in terms of energy security, uh, addressing the trade deficit. But is it the right time on a technology standpoint for heterojunction? Is there a window of opportunity, as has been argued? Adone, I'll, I'll throw this to you first. Or is really the window, we know there's a lot of development in China for heterojunction, right? Or, or will the actual opportunity be perhaps curfless, like Alex has, has said, or, or perovskite tandems or some other high efficiency pathway? So, I mean, I agree with uh, the, uh, the latest panelists that say that in order for, for any successful manufacturing in Europe, investors need to have clear visibility on what, uh, you know, what the policy framework is going to be to support uh, local supply chains and manufacturing in Europe. And in this sense, the US, uh, the US government uh, is really leading uh, this um, this uh, increased focus on, on security and, and sustainability of the supply chains. And actually, um, and there was a report yesterday uh, published that it really emphasized, you know, the, the, the need and, and the, the need to bring uh, local supply chains back, supply chains back into, into the U.S. And uh, I think there is a possibility that that message also uh, moves uh, to, to, to Europe. Regarding uh, Heather Janssen, which was your... Uh, your, uh, your question. It is clear that if Europe wants to compete, uh, it needs to differentiate, as Alex was saying before, and uh, it needs to go for products where the scale and the know-how and the supply chain is not already uh, with a very big advantage in these uh, giants uh, in, in mainland China. So in that sense, everything that is around new technologies that could bring either uh, slightly different supply chains 
or new technologies like perovskite tandem, where there is still uh, small developments outside of, of Europe and the United States, and where uh, European manufacturers might have the, the opportunity to lead from the beginning this new uh, technology wave, this could be an opportunity for, for European manufacturers to, to step in and, and lead rather than trade uh, in this technology development for, for the solar industry for the next, for the next uh, five years. Sparrows, do you have anything to add to that in terms of technology opportunities? No, I, I, yeah, I'd echo all of that. Um, it's it's tricky with n type now because the Chinese majors are making sort of lining up to make their jump, whether it's the Topcon or Hetero Junction or or both um, over the next few years. Um, so it's still this this tightrope walk of how you stay a little bit ahead. Um, and that might be for someone like Maya Berger with their smart wire, you know, that, that reduces silver usage, which is important for these new technologies. So that will keep keep them ahead for a little bit. And then obviously they need to, to be still working out what's the next step. So certainly tandems are a big opportunity coming down the road, but, but aren't ready yet. Um, so it, it is a challenge, this, this sort of stay, staying a step ahead. Um, but I definitely think that would echo that it needs to be something where the Chinese have not built up a lead already. Um, you know, going down the standard product route, I think for me is is going to be a very challenging route. You, you need to try and uh, stay a little bit ahead of them in that way. Okay, well, non-standard also applies to modules. Laura, what, as we wrap up um, this discussion from Ecoprojetti as a module uh, equipment and technology supplier, what about some of these differentiated products and applications? What about things like BIPV or even uh, vehicle integrated or, or yep. agri-PV we're seeing or floating? Are, are, you, are you working on projects and with European suppliers to, to develop these really quite different differentiated products for different market segments? Yes, definitely. This is one of our main <laughs> major uh, daily daily job to customize, to adapt the production lines and the manufacturing, keeping the same highest level of automation, but with the flexibility to adapt to the specific product, to the tile, to the cladding systems. As you mentioned, agricultural is very strong for Netherlands market uh, and greenhouses. Uh, so uh, clearly the production lines need to be adjusted uh, to match this type of niche market, which is uh, not only niche for Europe, uh, uh, being completely residential and industrial uh, rooftop base, uh, uh, our market. So clearly for BIPV, we are working a lot with the different type of solar cells, different type of matrix combinations in order to match uh, the final installation. So it's not that the panel need to adjust to the automation, but it's the automation that adjusts to the type of panel that we have to produce and to the final installation place where you have to uh, put the system, being a cladding, uh, so to have highest highest flexibility in the model dimension, very, very small, very, very huge, very big, long, or square-shaped. Uh, we work with really, really many different applications. And we agree, uh, the innovation is the only way uh, that we can keep on the, the production in Europe's, be in Europe, being with the HIT technology, being with Perovskite double. For sure, this the innovation is the one that leads uh, the difference and that makes us competitive uh, together with the um, against Chinese, of course. And it's not only the innovation on the, the product, the technology, but also on the way how we produce it. So the way we automate and become competitive uh, at the very end with the with the price of the unit produced, uh, even if it's not a standard unit, but flexible and adapted to the specific local market. That's the key. Okay, a clear message about innovation. We've got a project, quite an innovative one, coming up we're going to look at um, just after this. Thank you very much, everyone. Great. Thank you, Alex Thank you. Barrows from Exowoods, Elvata Nasconian of Recom, Laura Satora of Eco Progetti, and Edernes Loco of IHS Market. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, one of the advantages of European cell and module uh, production is supply chain transparency and potential windfalls in terms of sustainability. And it can also be a value proposition to buyers. Our next presentation is from a European materials supplier that has a very long track record and is currently working on projects to pursue circular manufacturing in PV. 
Michele Vanini is the business manager for PV at Coverme, having led the company's solar activities for well over a decade now. Michele, thanks for introducing this new project to us today at Roundtables Europe. Good to be here, thanks. Well, please, I, I would say without any hesitation, let's get stuck into it. Okay, so uh, let me... So we are going to um, talk uh, specifically about a closed loop uh, recycling system for PV bag sheet. So a little bit of background. So Coveme, as you probably know, have been manufacturing bag sheet material since uh, <clears throat> the early 90s. And we started off by using fluoropolymer materials. Then uh, we had to switch, uh, switch off to a more ecological friendly, uh, high grade polyester films uh, around 2006. And obviously today, Covemi is a strong believer that the bag sheet has to be technically sound, priced properly, and easy to manage during the end of life. So this is a key point for us. And nowadays, we know fluorinated product, products are now being classed by you as hazardous material, and they have no viable end-of-life outcome other than disposal on landfill. So... So this is what we dreamt. So we had already developed a PV bag sheet with a recycled content in, an, in a non-closed loop uh, uh, scenario. We dreamt to develop a closed loop recycling process to allow us uh, to recover the polyester in our PV bag sheet. We wanted to demonstrate it without any compromise in the performance of in a PV panel. So we team up with, uh, with DuPont Hygiene and Enea in Italy, which is the Italian national agency for new technology, to demonstrate the technical feasibility of this polyester-based uh, uh, bag sheet. So we provide a panel with a polyester-based bag sheet. Uh, Enea uh, use their own internal method to remove the PV bag sheet and obviously part of the encapsulant and adhesive through successive steps of surface abrasion. And the DTF analyzes the powder, basically, that we collect, the polymer we collect with the abrasion process. So you can see on the right side of the screen. So the material is depolymerized through a glycolysis technology to generate the monomer material, what is called the B-HET, the B-H-E-T, the B-HET. Um, the B hat uh, is is um, which we obtain, so it's of a high purity. And you can see that if you look at the right side of the screen, the DSC, uh, the first uh, um, and drawing, basically the plotting, is uh, related to the the. Mm, the material we, we collect from the abrasion surface. And there are different peaks that represent the adhesive, the encapsulant, and the polyester. The B had to uh, produce this high purity. And if you look at the bottom of the screen, you can see the peak of polyester. And um, so, um, so that is a high purity, we said, uh, and uh, demonstrate the removal of adhesive and uh, low trace, uh, uh, low level of trace metals. The, what is left over from this uh, uh, material can undergo further treatment to recover uh, either valuable components, could be through a pyrolysis, uh, or in the worst case scenario can be sent to energy recovery. So DTF dupont Gin then have polymerized uh, uh, our pet, the recycled pet, from the resultant B hat, and um, and the and the polymer produced uh, <coughs> met uh, um, DTF Dupont Gene specification. You can see in the screen the back sheet powder, the B hat, and the recycled polyester. Uh, DuPont used uh, DuPont Egin used um, uh, extruded the polymer to generate the cast film on, um, with this uh, pilot line, and then it stretched to a uh, bioriented polyester. This is the critical step, as it demonstrated that uh, the recycled polyester polymer produced is uh, suitable uh, to convert into a film that can be used again in a PV bag sheet. And uh, this is very interesting. So on in this uh, picture, you can see on the right side, the cast film 
and then is stretched on the left on the left side of the picture. And the film produces a good quality. And uh, you can see some of the data here. The TLT is very comparable with the virgin pet control. The ACE is slightly different, but there is a reason here because the ACE of the virgin PT control is lower because uh, they use an optimized catalyst, whereas it was not used in this uh, pilot line, but it can be matched uh, accordingly. Color-wise, uh, um, tensile strength and elongation to break, um, they all gave uh, um, very, very close uh, uh, results, data. So at the end, uh, um, we like to say that we successfully demonstrated the circularity, the closed loop of this new approach. So you can remove the polyester-based bag sheet, obviously with the, some part of the adhesive, have some part of the encapsulant. You can make it the B-hat, the, 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 the chip again, and then you can cast and obtain a recycled polyester film, which is uh, quite significant. Uh, the next stage, the next step would be to validate the concept on a larger scale. We already have customers that would like to go on with uh, uh, and make panels on a larger production run. Uh, so we need, um, uh, we need to uh, a wider collaboration across the supply chain to find the right uh, uh, partner, because this could be a viable um, approach. Um, we want to obviously want to uh, thank uh, Inea and uh, Dupont Tejin for the for the uh, common effort. And um, Jonathan, this is it. If you if you allow me, this is it. Actually, Michele, it's it's me, Frederike. Um, and I just want oh, to sorry. Um, <laughs> no worries at all. Jonathan is already getting ready for our next uh, speaker. But um, Michele, maybe you can tell us a bit more about what do you need to scale up and who should join that collaboration? What you just mentioned on your last slide, you mentioned the right partner. Who do you need? Ah, that's a good question. Um, we would need people to really. Um, uh, develop uh, the right scale to do with the in the in the hundred in the thousand because right now what we did we did the basically uh, uh, hand uh, single handed the, the panel so we would need uh, an industrial approach uh, be able to remove the, first to identify what is polyester base versus polymer versus fluoropolymer and then we would need uh, to, and we, then that is, there are a couple of options on the table. And then we would need somebody from, with an industrial background to be able to, del, to deliver the, let's call the powder, the polymer, to, to remove the polymer from, from the panel with the, uh, the proper output. And if we do that, uh, I think we have a good chance to, to be successful. Thank you, Michele. We actually have a question from the audience right now. From a recycler's perspective, is it hard to have a recycling process specific to a particular bag sheet manufacturer? And will this type of recycling process be competitive with competitors' materials? Uh, let me see if I understood properly. Um, I, I, th this process is, uh, is basically um, Select two two areas, so the fluoropolymer full versus the polyester base. So we this process we we came up with uh, is a uh, is a process where we 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 can only work on a polyester base uh, bag sheet, and in doing so we can reuse it and uh, again generated a new film to be used in in, in the PV bag sheet. So I don't know if that answer to, to the, the first question. So it, 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 it doesn't have to be a specific bag sheet manufacturer. It can be the, the family, a polyester base. Uh, it, can, it can't have any fluoro in it because that, that process doesn't work. All right. Um, and how much of the material do you lose during the process? 
That's a good, uh, that's a good question because it uh, hasn't been optimized yet. So it, it's, uh, it's, it, I would say it's quite significant right now, but it's, it's just because we are on, let's say, on R&D scale. Um, going into a, a pilot uh, mass production, uh, we, we don't expect to lose much. We, we, we said that the, the byproduct can be used in the pyrolysis because you obviously you end up uh, uh, collecting uh, um, uh, 100 microns of uh, um, encapsulant, at least 100, 200 microns of encapsulant, 10 microns of adhesive. So that is the material that you're going to remove. You are not going to use it in the, in the polymerization process. Okay, and one last question from our audience. Is your PET the same that is used in water bottles, fleas, the, the one that the regular consumer knows? No, not this specifically case, no, not in this case. No. Short and quick answer. Thank you, Michele. That was it for, from the time as well. Thank you for joining us today. Michele Vanini, Business Manager at Covema. At this point, I should also note that Covema is one of our partners in our UP initiative. Since 2019, PV Magazine has been driving the discussion about sustainability within solar and energy storage industries. The UP campaign involves quarterly themes for investigation in our global and German um, publications as well as online. Also alongside white papers and special webinars. We actually just had a very interesting one in the past week. Check it out online. And the current theme is green electricity supply. And in the past, we've taken on sustainable finance, toxic materials, recycling and end of life, as well as applications like AgriPV. Well, it's cool to see innovative pro projects like the circular manufacturing one being pursued by Coverme, and also great to see so many great questions coming from our audience. So thank you very much. Keep sending them through. And coming up now, we have an opportunity for you to kind of pick the brain of a leading sustainability consultant coming from, without, from outside of the solar industry. So we're looking a little bit further afield. Uh, Lubomila Yordanova is the co-founder and CEO with consultancy Plan A, which uses software to help companies monitor and reduce their carbon emissions and improve their ESG status. Lubomila, Welcome to our Sustainability and Made in, round, uh, Made in Europe roundtable today. Hi, it's my great pleasure to be here and I look forward to our discussion today. Fantastic. Well, we've heard about uh, circular manufacturing kind of in the early stages with the solar industry. One of the, our attendees commented, is there really the volume of, of solar modules yet to kind of complete circular manufacturing, which is one of the challenges we face in our industry. But looking at other industries, you know, how advanced are we seeing um, circular economy principles, um, you know, more widely throughout our economy? And secondly, how important are they in terms of pursuing uh, emissions reductions? It is a really important question and uh, unfortunately the answer is not one that probably uh, will convince us all that we're far ahead in the game. There's a lot of work to be done in terms of embedding circular methodologies and mindsets in the way products are developed. Um, and if I speak about the principles that are defining this movement, uh, there's three key ones. Of course, first of all, you need to design out waste and pollution. Uh, the second one is about keeping products and materials at use. Uh, so finding different uh, applications of the existing products, uh, repurposing. And then finally, regenerative uh, natural systems. So how do you allow for the natural systems to be looped in back so that no waste again is created? Um, of course, if we look at like the general picture, every business should be considering these principles. We need to also think that still a lot of the ways in which um, our production happens is following uh, outdated uh, or kind of old ways of uh, producing, old ways of designing. So that doesn't allow necessarily for these principles to be at the core. Um, the main challenges at the moment, um, I would say for many of the manufacturers is finding the right suppliers that have these principles embedded in the way they do their work and also changing how the business is operated. Because, of course, you need a different way of thinking, different way of your employees working in order for this to really be applied. 
Okay, well, you mentioned supply chains, and actually in the solar industry at the moment, we're having a very big discussion about supply chains and labour practices and these kind of things. It's a very contentious debate at the moment, but how, how important is it for manufacturers, for businesses more generally, um, to work or to look at their supply chain, engage with their suppliers in terms of decarbonising and, and achieving emissions reductions? What doesn't get to be measured is not really easy to act on because you don't have enough data to be able to derive some decisions. Um, so with this in mind, uh, we actually have developed our software, uh, which is allowing us to monitor the emissions of companies uh, that are quite complex in terms of their supply chains, in terms of financial institutions, uh, production hardware companies. And um, to be able to decarbonize, there's actually quite a lot of different steps you can take. But the first one is always related to monitoring your emissions, kind of kicking off the whole journey of data transparency. The vast majority of businesses, uh, regardless of the industry, uh, definitely in the manufacturing a lot more, but for many of the businesses, majority of their emissions are sitting in scope three, um, which is essentially where the core of the supply chain of a company is. This is where all your suppliers are. Uh, all of your uh, activities related to the employees traveling, logistics, and so on. Um, to put it in context, uh, an example would be Apple that has 98% of its emissions sitting in scope three, um, or a food manufacturer like Crafts, for example, uh, that has 90% of its emissions in scope three. Um, so in order to be able to reduce your emissions, you really need to focus on um, actually understanding uh, what are the building blocks in there and starting to engage these different third parties that are contributing significantly to your emissions um, and potentially uh, not necessarily familiar with the importance of sustainability. This is something we observe constantly with many of the larger clients that we work with. Well, and is there value then in having your supply chain closer to home? Because we, we've been talking about today, you know, made in Europe and, and how that supply chain perhaps can be supported. Are local suppliers easier to work with in terms of decarbonisation? There's a lot of benefits to localising your supply chain. And I believe COVID was a good evidence for us to see that we are so dependent on one another in terms of how we've built and designed our supply chains today that any kind of disruption that is based on climate change uh, and also the increased natural disasters that are influenced by climate change can easily stop you from being able to generate revenues. So actually localizing your supply chain can be quite beneficial because essentially you end up reducing upstream scope three uh, related to transportation and distribution. Um, and also allows essentially uh, the need for the long transportation. The complexity is obviously brought down as well, uh, giving you more visibility at each step. Um, that most likely also means that there's fewer intermediaries in the process. So you don't need to deal with that many stakeholders in terms of kind of defining uh, all of these different steps. Um, and essentially allows for you to also have with fewer suppliers uh, a lot more influence on how they think about sustainability and how they can engage uh, with the topic by you demonstrating to them the potential for cost savings as well as uh, emission reduction. Okay, well, the, the solar industry is one that is ruthlessly competitive when it comes to costs. So do you um, think that these efforts, these efforts to decarbonize supply chains, to bring manufacturing or your supply chain closer to home, does this have an impact on cost? Because my feeling is within the solar industry, if it's too expensive, we're not going to do it. <laughs> it's uh, interesting to observe how different industries are responding to this particular topic. I think uh, there's something fundamental that all of us need to understand, uh, which is uh, the long-term costs that we're going to bear by climate change if we don't adapt today. Um, the truth is, is that the way our economic and financial system works at the moment does not account for all of these uh, capex uh, that essentially is going to fall on our bill at the end of the day if we're not really prepared for uh, supposedly organizing the infrastructure that we have to be protected from these kinds of um, situations. So 
for anyone that is concerned that sustainability is a costly activity, maybe twist your uh, perception to the one where you understand how this is long-term impacting our planet as a whole and how a uh, um, demo of this uh, reality was COVID, where essentially uh, the whole planet essentially stopped on a mm, more personal, but definitely also on a corporate uh, company level. There was a lot of disturbances in the way that we were doing things. Um, and that was due to the fact that we were not prepared for these kinds of disasters. We were not prepared for these kinds of uh, disruptions that are outside of our uh, even model climate modeling mechanisms to be able to predict uh, with high accuracy because, uh, as we saw, uh, we were definitely not prepared for this. So for anyone that has doubts, uh, just think of the long-term effects. And um, there's plenty of companies like ours that allow for this long-term view to be really calculated and validated in numbers so you can then do a cost-benefit analysis and understand how you can prepare yourself for the future and also how you're going to be saving money in the longer term uh, just because you thought a few steps ahead of your competition. Lubo Milia, your Nova co-founder and CEO with Plan A. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. And we are coming to the end of our session. Today, we discussed funding for solar as available under the European Green Deal and post-COVID re reconstruction EU measures. However, impediments to accessing these funds for manufacturing remain. Arguments for made in Europe PV cells and modules can be advanced in terms of job creation, social license, energy security and supply chain transparency. And as you can see on our next slide, we also discussed enabling policy from R&D investments through to the funding of manufacturing projects is required. A window of opportunity and local expertise in heterojunction and perovskite tandem technologies currently exists in Europe. Increased component prices as, as a result of tariffs and higher cost structures could threaten European solar deployment. And on the last slide, a topic to not be forgotten. Circular economy practices and supply chain decarbonization can deliver a competitive advantage for European solar, solar manufacturers. Summary of some of what we've heard today. Thank you for your attention. And we've got one more request of you below this live stream. You can see a link to our survey. It would be great to hear from you what you thought of this two hour program. It really helps us improve our programming over the years. Thanks also to our platinum and networking partners and to our partners who actually took part in this session Belectric, Mayaburger, Fonadena, Recom, and Covema. And don't worry, this session might be over, but the program isn't. You can jump into Speed Networking right after the session and try out our specific and wonderful new tool. Or you can meet our session speakers in the Meet the Speakers room and continue the conversation there. Our French colleagues, Cornel Dibout and Joël Spies, have invited Nicolas Chaleur, partner at Everose. They will start the discussion about green hydrogen, battery storage, and electromobility in our French networking room. Join the conversation there to warm up for our Innovation Hub session this afternoon. Head over to the Spanish room to discuss module supply contracts with PV Magazine Spain editors Pilar Sanchez Molina and Emiliano Bellini, and PI Berlin senior consultant Asia Oscar. Also, our colleagues Mark Hutchins and Rachel Sorensen look forward to chatting with you in the English networking room. And as Jonathan has mentioned earlier, this afternoon at 4 p.m., you can also meet Gunther Erfurt in our German networking session. Again, actually. So, however, if you want to reach the top three in our scavenger hunt, um, play to win pick and pick up one of our fantastic prizes. Watch out. It closes at 1 p.m. today. Well, coming up on the live stream, the Innovation Hub hydrogen, battery storage, and electromobility, and how all of them are increasing opportunities for solar companies in different ways. The live stream continues right here at 2 p.m. Berlin time. Thank you for joining. This is my colleague Jonathan Gifford, and I'm Friederike Egerer. Goodbye. <laughs>